we all need food to live and to survive, right? It's a basic human need, and, and I think we have an obligation to do what we can to help provide transparency and information and inform decisions that support that globally. Hi, I'm Stephanie Tumampos, and you're listening to Down to Earth, the show where we talk to incredible geoscientists about their science and its impacts on our planet. This season, we're exploring stories of resilience, hope, and scientific insight into climate change. Global food insecurity has been rising in the last couple of years, and it will only increase in the future. With unpredictable weather patterns, heavy rainfall and droughts, climate change has been influencing the supply of food needed to satisfy a growing population. However, the way food is being produced is also part of the problem. The World Bank has estimated that a third of greenhouse gas emissions comes from the global food system. In this episode, we look into the role of remote sensing when it comes to food security and sustainability. This episode of Down to Earth is brought to you by the Remote Sensing Environment Analysis and Climate Technologies, or REACT Technical Committee of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. The REACT Technical Committee is a collaborative and supportive venue for all scientists and engineers looking to exchange ideas and share knowledge that advances our efforts to tackle climate change. To learn more and be part of this incredible cutting-edge community, visit grss-ieee.org and select the REACT Technical Committee. My background is in remote sensing and soil science and environmental sciences. Um, But way in the beginning of my studies, I shifted pretty quickly into working on agriculture and agricultural applications of remote sensing. This is Dr. Inbal becker Rishef. She's a research professor at the University of Maryland in the Department of Geographical Sciences, an adjunct professor at the University of Strasbourg, and the director for NASA Harvest, which is NASA's Global Food Security and Agriculture Consortium. Through this latter role, Inbal helps advance the adoption of satellite data to benefit decisions in food security and sustainability in agriculture. So remote sensing has a very critical role to play in helping to inform decisions that can support policies that can improve and support food security decisions. It can help and is helping to inform a lot of different organizations, whether it's World Food Program or USAID and many others on food aid and food aid decisions or on different investments that support different safety nets and social safety nets for food insecurity. So it does have a very critical role to play. NASA Harvest and others in the food security community have made great strides in connecting end users with important products like the GeoGlam Crop Monitor for Amos. But there's still a lot of work to do to meet Sustainable Development Goal 2, which is zero hunger by 2030. Let's learn more. Before we jump into a detailed conversation about food security, I think we need a working definition. So, what's food security? Sure. There are a lot of definitions and a lot of technical definitions of what food security is, but basically what it refers to or means is having enough food available to meet the nutritional requirements of a population or people and ensuring ultimately that everybody has access to it. And what are some of the factors currently influencing food security around the globe? There are many factors that influence food security or or food insecurity around the world. Um, whether you're thinking about sufficient food production and the availability of that production, whether that's um, food reserves, whether that's trade and, and trade systems, and then, of course, the production itself of, of agricultural products. Um, it also refers to the financial and physical means of people to be able to access food at any time. And that's going to have, obviously, very large implications for food security for different people and populations. Um, you have factors of the stability and the predictability of food supplies. And so if you have big fluctuations in production or big surprises in terms of markets of a particular country, that can have very large influences on prices and, of course, have very large implications for food security. Um, but I think what is acknowledged by the UN and the World Food Program and other organizations is that today, actually, conflict and war as well as uh, political instability, and then, of course, climate change are really very large driving factors of food insecurity globally, and, of course, inequality in in incomes and in access. That's really interesting. And is there one factor, let's say conflict, that outweighs climate change when it comes to rates of food insecurity? I think they're very interrelated. I don't think you can always separate climate and 
political instability or, or conflict and crisis, obviously sometimes you can. And I think the war in Ukraine is an example where that's not driven necessarily by climate, but there are other conflicts that are. Um, but certainly both a warming climate that translates into more extreme weather events that are also more frequent, um, that can have very large implications, especially if that kind of event, like a drought, for example, happens during a very critical part of the growing season, that can translate into very large losses in production. And on the longer term, as we're seeing a warming climate, that's also shifting the suitability of different environments and increases the variability of production in different environments for production of, of crops. And so that is also another longer term implication as well. Oh, yeah. When the Ukraine war started, I noticed an increase in food prices here in Germany. So I can definitely see how conflict and instability can affect food security. So Sustainable Development Goal 2 is zero hunger by 2030. Where are we at with achieving SDG 2? So we are unfortunately reversing a trend that started with reducing food insecurity rates. And since about 2014 or 2015, we've seen a reversal of that trend and, and food insecurity has only been increasing. So we're actually only getting further and further away from the SDG goal of zero hunger. Um, and in fact, just uh, since 2019, so between 2019 and 2022, we've seen the number of acutely food insecure people double according to World Food Program and, and FAO estimates. And so I think we've seen with the pandemic and inflation of, of food prices, various extreme weather events and various wars and conflicts and crises, including the war in Ukraine, um, have led to actually a, a reversal of, of that trend in, in increasing food prices. It is not only a question of increasing food production. It's also incre it's a very much a question of access. And so if we look at numbers of food production over that same amount of time, or if we look at numbers of crop commodity trade, those numbers have actually gone up while the numbers of food insecurity have gone down. So you're saying that we're never going to meet that 2030 SDG? Um, I'm absolutely not saying that. I very much hope we will. But what we're doing at the moment is we're going really in, in the, the wrong direction of that goal. Okay. So in your personal view, what do you think is influencing this reversal in food security rates? Um, I think a, a very large issue is our overall global food supplies and global food system. And it's all very unconnected, right? You can't just look at our food supply system without looking at poverty rates and looking at inequalities and looking at conflict and looking at the global picture. And I think that's the goal really of SDGs. They're all reliant and dependent on each other. You're right. I mean, that was a big question for me to ask. And as you rightly point out, there are a lot of other factors contributing to food insecurity. Let's move to the technical side of things. How do we use remote sensing, specifically the technology and products, to study food security? Sure. So I think remote sensing, as I think most of us are very well aware of, is playing an instrumental and increasingly crucial role in studying our land surface and how are we're impacting it, how we're changing it, how we're you know enabling our ability to monitor essentially almost every field across the world on a every week or less than every week basis. And that provides us really critical and important information, whether we're trying to understand even where are our croplands, how are they changing, what land covers are we expanding into or vice versa, are there areas where there were croplands and those are shrinking. And obviously, we have a lot more expansion than, than the other way around. Um, understanding which crop types are growing where around the world, and we still have a lot of work to do on being able to do that and to be able to do that in season, and in particular for smallholder systems and more complex agricultural systems. And understanding then what the cropping practices are. When were crops planted? What crop stage are they in? How are they developing? And from that, you know, being able to estimate, well, what is final production going to look like? So we're using a lot of different sensors for being able to do that work, whether we're thinking about optical sensors, obviously Sentinel-2, um, Modus and Veers, Landsat. And then if we think about more on the commercial space, on, on our side, we're actually using a lot of planet data as well. And, and um, we've found especially the daily cadence um, has been extremely helpful for us. Um, of course, the SAR 
satellites and Sentinel-1 being the, the major and, and obvious ones and thermal bands, where whether that's coming from Landsat or MODIS or, or VIRS again. So we're using a lot of different sensors and um, deriving a lot of different parameters. And I think one of the most important things we can start to advocate for and do is really starting to develop public good, what we've been calling in our side foundational data products. But those are, are things like cropland and crop type or field boundaries or cropping practices. And the more we can start to produce those kinds of products that are validated, that users can know are going to come out on a certain amount of, at a certain period and are going to be a regular product that's going to come, the more we're going to see these kinds of information products being taken up and integrated for a whole variety of, of products. And I think we've seen a very clear case of that from USDA, from the CDL, the, the cropland data layer. Um, that comes out every year. The accuracy of that information of the CDL is provided by USDA, so you know what you're dealing with or what you're working with. Um, and that has enabled a whole lot of other products to be built and, and services to be built on top of that kind of a product. Um, but very few countries around the world have that kind of information. Speaking of products, I want to ask about the GeoGlam Crop Monitor for Amos. But before I do, I think we need to understand who GeoGlam is and how they differ from NASA Harvest. Can you tell us? Sure. NASA Harvest is NASA's Global Food Security and Agriculture Program. Um, it sits within Applied Sciences. It was launched in 2017 um, and is run as a consortium. So while it's run out of University of Maryland, we have around 50 different public sector, private sector, government universities and organizations that are part of uh, NASA Harvest, where our main mission is to advance the adoption of satellite Earth observations by public and private organizations to benefit food security, sustainability, and agriculture worldwide. Um, GeoGlam predates NASA Harvest. GeoGlam was launched in 2011 by the G20 under the um, presidency of France. It was following right following the two major food price spikes and, and crises. Um, and it has a, a very similar mission in the sense of to help to coordinate across international organizations and ultimately to promote the adoption and use of satellite data. But it really serves as the international umbrella to coordinate across different organizations in the remote sensing and in agriculture community and space, ultimately to be able to serve as a bridge between research into operations and to help us coordinate and leverage each other's efforts and, and initiatives. Great. That really helps to clarify things. So tell us about the GeoGlam Crop Monitor for Amos. How does it support decision making with respect to food security? Sure. So the Crop Monitor is a large activity under the GeoGlam initiative. It was started very shortly after GeoGlam was launched. Um, when GeoGlam was launched under the G20, there was another initiative that was launched at the same time called AMIS, the Agricultural Market Information System. So while GeoGlam is very much focused on the remote sensing part of agricultural monitoring, AMIS is very much focused on the markets, market transparency, and, and economic side of things. And so when we were both adopted, one of the, in, in the language of the G20, it was stated that we would work together and in a complementary way. And so one of the first requests that AMIS came to GeoGlam with was, could we provide an international consensus on crop conditions for the AMIS countries. Now, AMIS countries are the G20 countries plus a few other countries. So they're the major production and export countries. And that was a really challenging task that we certainly rose up to the challenge. But the important part there was, was reflecting an international consensus. And so you can think of all the different um, ministries of agriculture that fall under the various G20 countries and, and various organizations, um, also international and UN organizations working in that space. And so what we did was to develop um, a largely remotely sensed driven assessment. So a lot of these different countries and organizations are already using remote sensing in their own monitoring systems. And this was a way for us to bring together the com community to intercompare across different assessments and to put together a global perspective of the major production and export countries. And the four crops that AMIS is focused on are maize or corn, right? Soy rice and wheat. Um, and to provide every month this kind of a map with information at the subnational scale of crop conditions. And so that a policymaker or somebody that is not with remote sensing expertise 
can very quickly have a look at this map and have a, a quick understanding of globally what crop conditions are, are looking like at that very moment. So, the Amos Crop Monitor. It's generated monthly through contributions by approximately 40 different organizations, right? So that is a lot of collaboration. And just building it from the start must have been quite the process. It was an interesting experience from our side to build that because initially, given that that is largely um, an economics community, you know, the information we provided them initially was like maps with NDVI anomalies and crop calendars overlaid on top of it. And it was pretty complicated graphics that for somebody from the remote sensing side would have been pretty clear what we were showing. But for anybody else, it was a is a mess. They didn't understand anything of what we were, we were putting them. They said, okay, we don't want the maps. Just, you know, we, we understand charts, give us charts. And so we said, no, well, let's work together because we do think that this is really the value that our community can provide. And so we did, but, but the lesson learned is we had to work really closely to understand what were their needs how could they understand this information and how could we translate actually very complex and, and lots of information into something very simple? And so that was, I would say, a process that took us around two to three years to come up with how we pr provide that information um, and has become a real key part of, of the market monitor. Now, one of the developments that came out of that was the early warning community came and said, well, wait a minute, like we have actually a lot more uncertainty around crop production in the countries that are already most vulnerable to food insecurity, um, wouldn't we really benefit from this kind of a structure? And so that's when GeoGlam launched the Crop Monitor for Early Warning. And so that brings together those organizations that are very much focused on the countries that are most vulnerable to food insecurity and the various early warning systems that exist. And so that would include the FAO, the JRC, USAID, WFP and, and, and also some regional organizations like IGAD, ICPAC and, and, and others that contribute into that process every month. And so there we have a lot more discrepancies. It's a very important process for being able to resolve uncertainties, to be able to share information, to be able to understand where discrepancies are coming from from different organizations and ultimately come to a consensus every month across all those different regions in the various countries. And so there is also the Crop Monitor for Early Warning that started in 2016. Uh, and both of those are operational products that we put out every month under the GeoGlam Secretariat. Coming up, we learn about the work that GeoGlam and others are doing to create the first up-to-date harmonized global crop type map for five major commodity crops. We also discuss what's on the horizon for remote sensing work in agricultural monitoring and what gives Inbal hope when faced with increasing rates of food insecurity globally. All this right after the break. Are you passionate about protecting our planet and tackling the challenges posed by climate change? Do you want to be a part of a remote sensing community that brings together the brightest minds in environmental science and engineering? Then you need to check out the Remote Sensing Environment Analysis and Climate Technologies Technical Committee or REACT CC for short. Here on the REACT Technical Committee, we believe strongly that interdisciplinary collaboration is key to making a real difference in our world. That's why we bring together experts from various fields to exchange ideas, share knowledge, and advance the science that drives our understanding of the planet. Whether you're a scientist, engineer, or simply someone who cares deeply about the environment, the REACT Technical Committee of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society is a place for you. Together, we can make a difference, one discovery at a time. Visit grss-ieee.org and select the REACT Technical Committee to learn more. Welcome back. Today we're speaking to Dr. Inbal becker rishef Research Professor at the University of Maryland, Adjunct Professor at the University of Strasbourg, and Director of NASA Harvest. Through our conversation so far, we've gotten some important insights into the complex factors influencing the current downturn in food security rates. And we've also learned about the powerful collaboration behind the widely used Amos Crop Monitor and the Crop Monitor for Early Warning. The question now is what's next in agricultural monitoring, especially when it comes to climate change? Let's dive back in to find out. You recently published an update for GeoGlam about creating the first up-to-date harmonized global crop type maps for five major commodity crops. So tell us about this recent accomplishment. Why is this update so significant? So this was a work in progress, I would say, for at least five years, maybe longer. 
because when we started the crop monitors, we one of the basic layers we needed in there was not just crop land, but crop type. So we would be sure to be monitoring and to be reporting on the right locations for the crops that we're monitoring. Um, and there wasn't really a good enough global product anywhere that we could use. And so the, what we did is we started to collect different national or regional products that were coming out. And we harmonized those across basically the, the globe to be able to provide then a harmonized products of at the time is the best available products that were publicly accessible and available. I feel like you're being too modest about the achievement of this work. I mean, it didn't it require harmonizing 24 national and regional data sets from 21 sources covering 66 countries? I can't even fathom that process or the challenges you must have faced. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, the main challenge is really understanding what the accuracies are, you know, resolution. Obviously, in some places, it's not at all optimal. Ultimately, what you really want to have is higher resolution products that are in season, but that doesn't exist. And so um, what we found is when you course in the resolution out and use it as a proportion or as a percentage, then that actually, in, in a lot of cases, in most cases, remains about correct between one year to the next. So we know there's crop rotations. And so if a field, you know, in, in a particular location was maize one year, it might be soybeans the next year. But if you've got a coarse enough pixel that actually the proportion of maize in your five kilometer pixel was probably still going to say about the same. And so that actually became very helpful for us for this product. But really looking at and, and making that those kinds of decisions was, I'd say, some of the challenge. But um, really, it was finding the products, getting access to them, integrating them and, and making some of those decisions. Well, I could see that kind of challenge because I think in many parts of the world, there isn't really that kind of data, especially in developed countries. Um. Near the start of our discussion, you mentioned small landholders. We've heard from other researchers that incorporating this data can be challenging because of the size of the farms and their specific circumstances. So how are we including their data into our agricultural monitoring? Yeah, I mean, I think that still remains one of the biggest challenges for our community is how is investing a lot more effort and also having the ground data that is needed for being able to develop cropland and crop type maps for very complex smallholder agricultural systems where the fields are a lot smaller, where we have intercropping, where the shapes are a lot more complex. Um, many regions are very cloudy. And so there are a lot of different challenges for being able to map these regions. And I think it's it's very important that we invest in that, but in particular, that that happens in very close partnership in the local context and with uh, regional partnerships and national partnerships to be able to advance and do that. Because it's not just about doing the research for that, it's ultimately about how do you develop systems that are going to be sustained and going into the future and really ultimately supporting and benefiting the various locations that they're being developed for. I agree that partners in the local context need to be involved in this work. And I know NASA Harvest really focuses on working with end users from the start of the process. Yeah, our focus is on that bridge between the state of the science and the state of applications, right? And making sure that we're not just publishing papers that on and products that are really great and interesting and maybe highly accurate, but really that, you know, what is driving our work are our various partners and end users such that ultimately they're going to make a difference and they're going to be used and uptaken. And ultimately what we'd like to see is more adoption and utilization of Earth observations data into informing a variety of agricultural decisions really across the agricultural sector. Because already we have so much that has already been developed that is not being used. So of course, there's a lot more on the research side that we need to be doing that we can be doing. But there's a lot that is already is there, whether you're thinking about looking at, you know, how do we better advance the transition to sustainable practices, understanding what crops, where, when, what makes the biggest difference to understanding production and being able to provide early warning to perhaps being able to advance more um, credit to farmers and in, in particular in countries that don't have a lot of access today for credit or for insurance for different farmers. So there are a lot of different applications that we're working on that, and we're not the only ones, right? This is a very large community and that's where the GWAM umbrella comes in is being able to learn from each other, to coordinate and leverage each other's investments. So ultimately we were all moving together as a community towards a common goal. And what is missing from our work in agricultural monitoring? In your view, what needs to be developed or researched further? Gosh, a lot. <laughs> um, I, 
I think the you know ground data and, and lack of representative ground data will continue to be a major roadblock for for us to be able to continue to advance. I think there are a lot of really exciting advances on the machine learning and AI side, including on our team, that are helping to help mitigate some of that. But of course, having more uh, ground data and thinking about how that's being also collected in in such a way again that they're not one offs, but how do we really develop the partnerships for for those kinds of collection? I think again, investing a lot more in understanding smallholder systems. I think you know on on our side, one of the big priorities is setting up a new center on rapid agricultural assessments. I think that's something where we've seen a major gap in information. Um, and in, we initially, that wasn't one of the first kind of goals of Harvest when we first started in the first phase, but we started to get a lot of different requests, whether it was under the pandemic from the government of Togo, there was the derecho, there were some requests around the conflict in, in Tigray and looking at planted change in areas. And then with the war in Ukraine, where we're still working um, very closely with the government there, with the Ministry of Agriculture, to be able to fill information gaps in real time where there isn't any other information that's being able to to come together there. So I think having a, a a center that can provide rapid assessments, whether it's due to extreme weather event, um, as we're seeing more and more of, or due to conflict or war or any other unexpected events, so where remote sensing can really play a critical role, I think can make a, a tremendous difference. And as climate crises continue to increase, we definitely need to have a rapid turnaround on understanding their impact on agriculture and food security, right? Yes, both on the adaptation and the mitigation side of, of things. Agriculture is a big contributor, obviously, we, we know that, but can also um, be part of the mitigation. And so um, understanding, one, what are the practices? How do we shift to a more sustainable agricultural system? Where does it make sense? What kind of crops, what kind of practices, where and, and what can the implications of those be? And so I think in certain cases, we know that often the initial transition to different practices can translate into a productivity hit. It might translate into soil health and, and other kinds of benefits, but really being able to understand that and having the data, um, and, and I think satellite data, again, can be a really big contribution in being able to start to develop that that evidence basis. And, and again, there's a lot of that work happening um, across different partners on NASA Harvest side and including our um, SARA initiative as well, but many other activities that are very much focused on that. Well, a big part of these changes to our agricultural practices is dependent on policymakers. So in your view, how effectively are we supporting policymakers with remote sensing data and what still needs to change? I mean, I think we're making good strides. One is being able to have policymakers and different decision makers being aware of what the capabilities are of remote sensing, what kind of data can it provide, where, how can they util best utilize it to inform their own decisions. And I think within the GeoGlam community, we've made tremendous strides in that, working really between the, um, the GeoGlam and the AMIS and the GeoGlam and the early warning communities. Uh, I think on the NASA harvest side, we again, on the Ukraine side, we've been able to provide information that was used to making decisions in this past year. And we're continuing to do that kind of work. I think there are lots of examples of where we've had successes. Um, I think a lot of our work in, in sub-Saharan Africa as well has had a lot of implications for developing safety net programs and countries adopting these kinds of systems and making their own decisions based on these systems and, and data. But of course, there's still a tremendous potential left for satellite data to continue to have implications and to inform decisions on food security and agriculture, on sustainability and, and, and what have you. Um, I think we've got to be very clear about what our capabilities are and what they are not, um, where we're, we're moving to be able to provide uncertainty, to be able to benchmark our products. Because I think what we're seeing is with so much availability of data of cloud computing, we're also seeing just a tremendous amount of products being put out there. And as a user, you kind of think, okay, well, how do I decide what product am I going to use? How do they intercompare? What are the accuracies? Where does it work? Where it doesn't work? And I think that's us on our community to start to really benchmark our products and to be able to um, provide that kind of information as well. And what keeps you hopeful about food security in light of climate change? There are a lot of passionate smart people working on it. I think it's, you know, a lot of doom and gloom and I'm often very depressed about it. I think at the same time, I mean, if I look at my my own kids um, who are in, you know, kindergarten and elementary school ages, they're already learning about climate change. And they say to me, mom, we shouldn't use a car. You know, we only use a bike and, you know, very conscientious about climate 
and our actions in a way that when I was growing up, certainly there wasn't that awareness. And so I think we've come a long way, but obviously we're very far from where we need to be to really take the policy and the really bold actions that we need to, because I think climate change is here now. And I think where many forecasted thought, you know, what we're seeing today was going to happen 30 years down the line, 40 years down the line, um, is happening today and is actually happening and impacting some of the most vulnerable people that have contributed the least to where we are today in terms of, of climate change. So I think it's an urgent challenge, but you know, we've got to stay optimistic and 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 continue to to advocate for what we think is is right and and critical for for us and for our future generations. Mm -hmm. We want to empower our listeners to take action to combat climate change. So what's one concrete action you think they could tackle in their own lives, either as researchers or as citizens, to support proper food security? I mean, I think one to understand where we are, understand what the situation is globally, um, be very conscientious consumers understand where your food is coming from, um, be conscientious about waste. I think reducing you know, meat consumption and, and animal product consumption is obviously really important as well. But I think being aware and conscientious and being curious and feeling that every little difference will make a difference and that's what we need to do, being able to educate others and then you know, as much as people can be active in their own communities as well. Well, that's all for this season of Down to Earth. Want to learn more about Dr. Inbal becker Rushef? NASA Harvest has a very good website. I think we're active on social media. GeoGlam also has a very good presence on social media, and we have a web presence. So I guess the, the, the usual ways of following different programs and contacts. Be sure to follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, where you can check out episodes from seasons one to four. By following us, you'll also be updated on any future seasons of the podcast. Finally, don't forget to send some love to our sponsors at IEEE underscore GRSS on Twitter and Instagram and IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing on Facebook and LinkedIn. This episode was produced by Nicole Bedford from Nicole Bedford Films with help from me, Stephanie Tomampos. Graphics and design by Mylene Briggs of Kila Media. And a special thanks to Irina Hansek of ETH Zurich and the German Aerospace Center for her support. I'm Stephanie Tomampos and you've been listening to Down to Earth.